Back in 1972, a man by the name of Mike Warnke published his book, The Satan Sour. The book painted the childhood of Warnke as an extremely unfortunate one. For starters, he was orphaned as a child. Then he became a drug addict and an alcoholic. And if that wasn't enough, he was then sucked into a demonic cult. During his time among the Order, he was forced into various satanic rituals. This included the likes of conjuring up spells, summoning demons, and even kidnapping and harming individuals for the sake of pleasing Satan. He even claimed to have spent some time with Charles Manson. This life of his allegedly went on for nine months. That was until, however, it was interrupted by an attempt on his life when the organization attempted to end his life by making him overdose on heroin. The event obviously made him disillusioned with the entire community. From then on, he vowed he would leave the group and do better. Soon after leaving, he would go on to clean himself up, fight in Vietnam, become a war hero, and even find Jesus. Eventually, his story would spread across the United States and would resonate deeply among the Christian community. Despite the fact that his story did culminate with a happy ending, the rest of the recollection served as a cautionary tale that Satanism was an encroaching threat and that we must be on the lookout for its presence. To many, this book was the gospel truth, and that truth was that cults did exist within our society. However, if the Satan seller served as a mere warning, then the book Michelle Remembers was the klaxon alarm to let everyone know that the devil had arrived, and he was coming for our children. everyone and welcome to the you go first podcast this is our fresh and shiny brand new podcast that will cover all kinds of spooky happenings here we'll talk about haunted history urban legends and just the overall unexplained my name is austin and i am joined as always with fernando so what are your thoughts about this one fernando <laughs> what are your initial thoughts well as everyone knows i'm joined by my co-host austin here because i'm the real host anyways so i got i have a lot of thoughts on this one and i'm glad we were choosing this one to start off our podcast because this one i grew up very protestant and this is something that hit close to home because i was a very religious kid i had a lot of uh religious in influences in my life that kind of taught me that you know if you don't behave you're going to hell and if you don't behave the devil's gonna come get you it was very traumatizing for a kid. I don't know why they thought that was an effective parenting method, but I don't think it's very effective. I think it's actually kind of turns people off to religion, in the case of me at least, because it's like, oh, I guess anything I do isn't good enough because <laughs> I'm going to hell no matter what. And like, even for the thoughts I think, or for touching myself, <laughs> like whatever it is, it's like, <laughs> listen, man, I'm just, I'm a human. I'm given a human nature and I can't really stop it. So the fact that the devil's coming for me, it's like, can I really stop him if, like, literally everything's going to send me to hell? I don't think so. I mean, I didn't really grow up with religion, to be honest, but... It's big in the South. I, I, I was, I, I, came from, I came from the South, and Texas is huge. When we moved to upstate, like, Vermont, but, like, it was kind of traumatic as a 14-year-old, because you're like, oh, no one goes to church here. <laughs> yeah, no, up, actually, like, to be honest, like, there's actually, there's actually more churches around the Burlington area than I expected there to be when I moved yeah. up here. And, um, no, I mean... Again, like, I don't have much firsthand experience, but I've kind of always viewed, like, what you're talking about, teaching kids about religion, and it's kind of a way to, you know, keep you in mind, make sure you're scared, you know, you do what you're supposed to do, you, it's kind of almost like the boogeyman, <laughs> like, it's, or... it's definitely a way, I think, I think, in a sense, religion has been weaponized oh, to basically yes. be uh, a tool for control, right, like, mm -hmm. Hey, give to the church, obey the church, and if you don't, if you do, you'll be a good Christian. You'll go to heaven, or whatever. At least in my religion, and perhaps I was just like a bad church I went to, right? Maybe I'm just disillusioned, and I'm kind of like jaded on the whole experience. But I definitely feel like the satanic panic is not a one-off, and I think like it's kind of cyclical, right? We're going through like a little spiritual crisis in America right now, where people are kind of like. 
like an earthquake in New York City. They're like, oh, it's a sign from God. I'm like, well, we got the eclipse coming, you know, in a, another in a couple sign. Days, so you know, and back in back in the back in the day, early civilization, that was always a sign that like repent for the end is near. Like, uh, definitely, it feeds into stuff like the satanic panic. It definitely uses fear as a mechanism to get you to go to church, to get you to repent, to get you to. And you know what? Maybe it's a sigh up by the church. Maybe the whole Maybe. thing is a sigh up. You know, they're like, hey, Satan's here. Come to church or else. Well, I guess we'll uh, use that as our segue into the satanic panic. If you'd like to uh, take oh, and take it away with the first paragraph. Well, before I do, do you have any other thoughts? Like, I know I kind of rambled a little bit there. You can edit it up to not look like I was talking the entire time, I guess. Oh, that's, that's fine. I uh, did, I'm very passionate about this because oh, it's I, something that greatly affected me. I know you're very passionate. I honestly, like, the thing is, I didn't really have much of an opinion about it until I kind of moved to an area where it was more common. Yeah. And I have, first of all, I have nothing against any religion. Like, yeah. the, no, religion I, itself I, I is not really a bad thing. Either. Like, I really, like, like, I'm jaded, but, like, if you believe what you believe, that's okay. Bye. Yeah, like, I think religion can have its good things. Like, actually, one thing I have to admit that I'm a little jealous of um, is churches or any, are typically good at developing a community so it's nice to know you have people Get with similar money. thoughts and interests that you can rely on in case you have issues i mean it's in some churches are very generous and they donate to people who have medical issues and stuff um we've actually um with something we've dealt with somebody we didn't even go to the church we don't, didn't even know this church existed and they heard about our situation and they helped us so i'm not gonna really? say here. Nice. yes i know it's good it, caught us by surprise um so church are great and religion's great but like you had mentioned earlier when you weaponize it that's the problem and when you it's hard to uh it's hard to combat weaponized religion because if you say you know one thing you have a whole entire community the one i just talked about coming at you and it's your reverse theirs and there's nothing you can say or do that's going to change their opinion because it's their faith there's nothing you're going to do in that in essence leads us to the satanic panic because this was a, essentially a decade of your word against theirs and as you'll see we'll get into how that happened and what transpired well take it away so the satanic panic of the 1980s was definitely a cultural phenomenon that spanned not just north america but the entire world being the whole occurrence was mostly characterized by widespread belief uh, that ancient satanic cults were coming out of hiding and were attempting to indoctrinate and harm our children for the devil's pleasure. For the most part, this resulted in a variety of daycare and school providers being accused of committing satanic ritual abuse, later known as SRA, against children. And honestly, if I was growing up this time, I wouldn't want to be an educator because it was basically a bunch of kids accusing adults of like oh i i think he touched me i don't know like he probably like did this it's a scary it's tough because you don't want to like this is first of all we we picked a nice light topic to start Listen. this all off with <laughs> um kids say the darndest things they the do. amount of times my niece or my nephew has accused their grandpa of abuse when like it's really they just tripped and it's like oh grandpa <laughs> grandpa pushed me it's like no i saw <laughs> grandpa did not push you. Like, right right you're you're right kid you know it's such a tough thing because you can't, you know, if someone makes an accusation like that, you can't just ignore it. I mean, that's, that is how issues start because historically people have ignored accusations like that and they turn out to be true. And that's not just the case with religion. That's many situations. But on the other hand, you know, as again, we'll learn people's reputations and lives were completely destroyed and they had they had nothing to do with anything they were being accused of. It gets pretty dark pretty quick about what happened to so many people. And honestly, it's pretty jarring that society let this happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not the first time. It won't be the last it, time. It won't be the last time. Like, time is time is a flat, what do they call it? A flat circle. It's cyclical. Like, there will be another religious panic in the future. And I, oh, think, we're, I think it's kind of currently happening right now. To be honest, actually, what could maybe trigger it is the amount of people renouncing their religious ties or just not even being involved you know if you do of... look at studies religion is slowly on the decline it, like, it is it, and you know what i think it's 
it could be a culmination of things. It could be that there's just so many different religions in the world. It can be that people are kind of like just doubting that like these, uh, I mean, with religion, it's all about faith, right? That's the entire, that's the entire point. And people nowadays really just want hard evidence and they want, they want to see it. They want to see it in photos, videos, like, uh, documented by like scholars and not just like some guy that wrote a book. And as you'll see, this was not a time for that. This was like, Hey, this guy wrote about this. That's facts. Right. It's well, it's like most religious just text to be quite honest with you. <laughs> anyway, I just saw the book of Mormon and that is so true. <laughs> uh, anyways, as many as 12,000 cases involving spirit or satanic ritual abuse, SRA, spawned throughout the world during this decade. Many people's lives were turned upside down as reputations and even freedoms were eroded away by fearful communities and kangaroo courts. For many, this is essentially a repeat of the Salem witch trials of the McCarthy hearings all over again. And it won't be the last time that this happens in our society. No, I mean, like I said, it might be happening right now. As mentioned in the intro, a book named Michelle Remembers was essentially the catalyst that set everything into motion. While the Satan seller began this, Michelle Remembers solidified this. Michelle Remembers is a non-fiction book that documents the therapy sessions of a patient named Michelle Smith, who was initially suffering from depression. The book itself was written by her psychiatrist, Lawrence Pazder. Throughout the book, Pazder used a controversial and now discredited method called recovered memory therapy. And apparently this method was used in a response to repeated statements by Smith claiming that she believed that she had something important to tell Pazder, but she couldn't remember what it was. Yeah, so... And you know what? Go ahead. I know this is discredited, but okay, listen, I did therapy. And like, there is a, like, I, I have a pretty decent memory, right? It's like everything beyond the age of like three, right? Like, because they tell me that I used to like do like these crazy stuff as a kid, but like really, but like before three years old, I don't remember much. But I remember one time my therapist was asking... She's like, cause I was just like, I was a very anxious person. So when I went to therapy, my therapist like trying to get something out of me. Right. And I feel like she was using this <laughs> because it's she's like, possible. I mean, she was like, have you ever been like inappropriately touched by someone that you trusted? And I'm like, no. And she's like, are you sure? I'm like, pretty sure. Like in my therapy sessions, I was able to pretty much like, I went for a few years and I was able to pinpoint kind of like my major trauma points that led me to my like my most traumatic experiences that I needed therapy for and recovered memory was definitely not it no. for those of you that don't know what we're banging on about recovered memory therapy is a catch-all term for a variety of pseudoscience therapy methods pseudoscience being stuff that's not rooted in scientific research like it astrology. hasn't proven yet no even though I believe in astrology but don't tell anyone <laughs> That includes stuff like hypnosis, past life regression, which I believe there's a Tesla. Anyways, guided imagery and many other things. <laughs> Can you tell who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> none of these many, none of these methods have been scientifically proven to produce accurate or meaningful results. Now, I do want to start off by saying that I don't, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Okay. Like the, the stuff, I don't believe hypnosis works. I don't believe in past life regression. I've never been in hypnosis. Um, I do think we got reincarnated, though. I will say, like, I'm not against the, like, but I also believe if you could prove it to me, I would be open to it. I'm not one of these people that no matter what you tell me, I'm not going to believe that. It's That's like ghosts, lie. which we will talk about later. That's um, a lie. <laughs> And this another... guy's seen firsthand experience. <laughs> like this guy's seen ghostly activity. Dude, okay, well, that, it. that'll be for another episode. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyways, I'm sorry. I did not mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> I like it. I know. I like it. We're just, we're just, we're rambling, you know? This is the fun one. Probably right? people are going to, people are going to unsubscribe from our gaming channel and be like, these guys are weird. Probably me mostly. I'm a weird guy. I'm sorry. Hadster, after using these methods in a session, claimed that Smith randomly began screaming on Control B for 25 minutes straight. Eventually, after. He calmed her down. He realized that Smith's memory and voice had reverted back to when she was a five-year-old. How he can tell that she was five years old? I don't know. This continued on and off for the next 14 months. And after logging over 600 hours of therapy, Smith remembered that her mama, that her mother, Virginia Proby, had exposed her to ritual satanic abuse when she was a child. According to Smith, 
She was subjected to multiple rituals that were administered by the Church of Satan, one of which that supposedly lasted 81 days straight, which I don't know how you don't remember 81 days straight of torture, <laughs> you know, but like, okay. During these rituals, she was locked in a cage, assaulted, witnessed sacrifices, and even rubbed with blood and various severed body parts. Yeah. When it's... I'm sorry. So, no, no, you're fine. Um, yeah. So I just want to make a little note about the format of this because I don't want to let the facts get in the way of a good story. So we're going to basically throughout most of this, you'll get the story, how it was told, you know, in, in situations like this, obviously it was a ghost story. Well, you know, the whole thing's fake, right? Fernando? No, ghosts are real. <laughs> um, but Spirits any, are real. Anybody who's sitting here screaming at us being like, this is absolute bull. I promise you. I promise you this story is 100% true and you can fact check all of this. <laughs> I'm a big person on fact checking, which is why I don't like a lot of stuff nowadays. But trust me, this is real. <laughs> this actually happened. <laughs> Anyways, we'll give well, you okay, the... Well, let me, let me clarify not the satanic abuse. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Michelle thinking she was satanically abused and the psychiatrist going with it, that actually happened. Oh, this yes. is real. This is real life stuff. Yes, that, that definitely is. But we'll give you, we'll be sure to wrap it up with a bunch of facts at the end. So you're going to get uh, some stay closure tuned. in this. So don't worry about it. All right. Just had to pop that in there. That's okay. So where were we? When, when asked why. Michelle didn't have any scars from said event. She claimed that the final occurrence was interrupted by the Virgin Mary, uh, the Archangel Michael, and even Jesus Christ himself. Additionally, her memories of these events were wiped by the trio and would come back when the time was right. Very convenient. Yes, it usually is. There's a lot of convenience in here. <laughs> that's usually the case with the religion, but that's okay. The story would become so big... That Smith and Padster would eventually make over three hundred thousand dollars from various book deals, and Smith would even go on to appear on the Oprah Winfrey Show alongside Laurel Rose, another supposed cult survivor turned successful author. Funny how they always turn successful authors. Oh well, yes, that's when money gets involved, on I mean, things miraculously happen. Yeah, and events miraculously get remembered. During the interview with Oprah, it should be noted that Oprah never questioned the authenticity of either story. Instead, she just promoted it as straight facts. And in her defense, however, she wasn't alone in being fooled into believing the story. And also, that's kind of what you get with daytime TV. They don't really, they're not, they're there for a good story. They don't really, yeah, they they don't really care. If you like, get someone the facts and it's boring and no one's going to tune in. Which, honestly, that's kind of like how all TV is nowadays, including sports. And it drives me, like, I can't watch any TV nowadays because it's just, it's all clickbait. Even articles, like, I knew this guy that wrote for this, like, car magazine. And, like, he just would write the most insane, asinine stories just for clicks, dude. Um, I forgot said, what the magazine was called. You might remember the magazine. I don't remember. Uh, I don't know, but he sounds like a cool guy, though. No, nah, no. Nah, he, he likes Fast and Furious, <laughs> and he thinks that's real. He thinks you can send the car to space. Well, you can, and I, and Elon Musk has done it. Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right, so a little bit about the culture that kind of formed during this time period because of said panic. Uh, the result from the smash hit book, Michelle Remembers, was a decade of stranger danger promotion, specifically among the middle class, and a rising suspicion that anybody in your neighborhood who was odd was more than likely worshiping the devil in their spare time. This culture of suspicion led various community leaders to villainize all kinds of things that were deemed to have been immoral or promoting the wrong message. For example, metal and rock and roll was labeled the devil's music. Ugh. Artists and bands like that of Metallica, Judas Priest, and Black Sabbath were portrayed as patrons of Satan who were spreading his propaganda with their music. Can I just pause <laughs> on the devil music for a second? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah let's rewind. Let's go back. I, so, as a young Protestant growing up, they, they said they essentially echoed the same sentiment. And the entire time, I just like, I was just in like my head, but, but that music's fun. Like, it's, it's cool. Well, yeah, it's catchy. That's why, that's why kids like it. It's just like, and the entire time growing up, I'm like, do these guys actually worship Satan? Like, I don't see a lot of, like, like, are they actually worshiping the devil? Like, come on. I was just like, their, their music's too good. There's no way. And they had, they'd have sold out crowds. I'm like, there's no way there's this many, like, <laughs> Satan worshipers. Like, I'm like, come on, let's be real. I don't see this many people at church. Like, <laughs> one of my favorite things to kind of do with this, um, it's not just 
necessarily being the devil's music it's just the quote-unquote immorality of the music i mean um, okay listen it is immoral because they're oh, like oh no i'm not i love this music. it's all I'm not sex drugs and rock and roll dude like like listen i get it but when you're a teenager you know that's the message you want to hear um but one of my favorite things is um the lead singer of i think it was twisted sister was called into court dean and, schneider yes dean schneider and um you know when you get like a well no one gets cds anymore but i think you know, he did you, the goofy goober song i'm not even kidding like you know i'm a goofy oh yeah i'm sure rock. he did that would make sense we well, know the, dean schneider, baby. the parental advisory thing that was in the corner of every cd is that did he start that well he didn't start it but he was called in as like a key witness about you know to testify basically they wanted someone who they deemed would look like an idiot and would come into the courtroom and look like a rocker and talk like a rocker and he was actually very articulate tell me with he his was words. yeah dude, he was super at, he came on, in dude. dressed like hell like yeah he, would. he was ready he was super dude. articulate with his words and the best part about that is I know we're that's awesome off, tra- um off topic here it's a podcast that can deal with it. cds that actually had the parental advisory thing in the corner sold more than any other so- cd because yes. kids Look, wanted that so they listen. went for it <laughs> this is great listen, i still kind of believe in a god right but like growing up when they try to be like oh turn off that metallica listen to hillsong united instead like this christian band it's like christian <laughs> music's just as good as rock and roll and i'm just mm. like even as a kid i'm like this isn't <laughs> like this kind of like this is boring <laughs> yeah so it's... listen I totally get the explicit stuff because the explicit stuff is better. Like something about portraying a, a more lively story. Trust me. I also feel and I'm not I'm not an artist by any means. I you don't want to hear me sing. Um, I do actually. No, you do not. No, uh, I, I actually do. Anyway, well, maybe someday you will. Maybe when maybe. we hit 200 subscribers, there's a little sneak peek for you. Um. Yeah. No. Uh, I feel if you're swearing and stuff in your music you're kind of not holding back. You're saying what's on your it's mind. Exactly. So don't be wrong. There are some songs that are clearly pandering and they're trying to toss as much sex and stuff in there and stuff just because they, you know, they want younger people sex, to, sex. Want to be attracted to it, you know? Yeah. But, um, everyone's just horny at that age. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right. Anyways, moving on from music, we get to talk D&D, about board maybe. games. Uh, even a board game called Dungeons and Dragons was suspected to have been used to recruit individuals into evil cults. D and D, as it became known as, was first name dropped in affiliation with satanic wrongdoing when a sixteen-year-old genius named James Dallas Egbert the Third. Man, that is the name of a genius right there, the child prodigy. Uh, anyways, he uh he vanished without a trace from his Michigan State University dorm room. Which is kind of, you know, concerning, you know, this kid's 16. You know, know, I feel like these geniuses, like, they're usually really smart kids, but, like... Oh, very. They usually suffer from some type of, like... Like, I don't like I don't want to say all of them. Just, like, a neurodivergent thing. Like, like something's probably wrong. Like, you're probably either anxious, like, or you're very, like, socially anxious, something like that. Maybe I'm just stereotyping, but I feel like there's always, like... Because I've known at least two geniuses that were... Um, they were just, they needed help. Like they needed some assistance. I feel part of it too is it's, it's gotta be kind of hard because, um, believe it or not, I am not a genius. Um, I know you I know, think even that. The, even the everyone at work thinks you. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but it's gotta be kind of hard to relate. Like, because, okay, think, think about it. I think this, it's hard you know? to relate and I think there's a lot of pressure that they have to cope with. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, people everyone are thinks you're a genius. You to be basically right all the time. And when you're wrong, it hurts. And it hurts. Yeah, it could be very traumatic when all which, of a sudden people think, oh, this genius messed up. Maybe he's not a genius. Which I also Are think her. that fosters a mentality of I'm always right. Yeah. You have to be the smartest person in the room. Even well, if you're not. You get, let's say you get narcissists. Right. Um, but, you know, the other thing, too, is you got to think if you're in eighth grade and you're, you know, it's quite clear. You're a kid who's going to go far. You know, you're going to mm-hmm. you're you're at like an 11th grade level. How do you relate to an eighth grader? I'll tell you, I was, I was a freaking moron when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> Yo, I thought I was smart because I was are. good at history. That was about it. <laughs> God, I love history. I, I miss history. Which is actually, we're talking about this, actually, we're doing this. this is history. And you know what? Like, the more people that we can educate about history and historical events, maybe they can do some research and realize that, hey, like, when something like this starts to happen again, they'll be like, where have I seen this before? 
Maybe. Or, you know, holding YouTube live shows at the Stewart's. Went to and bought. Stewart's. <laughs> yes, at Stewart's. The Stewart's parking lot. On... <laughs> <laughs> they won't come out to New York. Oh, God. All right. So uh, after uh, Egbert III uh, disappeared, his family hired a private investigator who actually already had suspicions that the board game was playing a part in his disappearance. The reason why I act- why he actually thought so was simply because he played the game. That was literally it. There was not there was nothing else. He just investigated it, asked him, you know, tried to figure out what he did, and it turned out he played the game. One of the first things he heard, he decided, okay, well, that's got to be it. Um, it did yeah, turn out, however, investigators used to be so bad. I still think they're most in bad. Well, anybody can be one. Yeah, um, I, I, we knew one. We did know one, <laughs> and uh, he didn't. He did not have credentials. No, God, no. He had no credentials to be a private investigator, except that he was he, he was a self-proclaimed private investigator <laughs> pretty much uh it turned out however that egbert had simply retreated to the tunnels underneath the campus and was simply hiding out apparently he's right maintenance tunnels so you know oh, clearly... I was thinking catacombs in french no in not, not that it was just maintenance tunnels mm. um it turned out that he did have mental issues and yeah. later took his own life later oh. in 1980 um so despite this man. tiny fact uh, many still believe the board game played a part in his tragedy. Um, another time D&D was involved in teen suicide was when a high school student named Irving Lee Pulling died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Uh, like that of the private investigator in the earlier case, Pulling's mother believed that the nefarious board game was the cause of the teen's early demise. This is kind of when some of the crazy accusations start coming out. So, Well, this is, this is what drives me crazy about, like, what is it? <sighs> parents of this generation, like, listen, my parents are very old school, too. And when I first started going to therapy, they thought I was, they thought I was a, they thought I was crazy because, like, who goes to therapy? But this is what these kids needed at this time, man. Mm-hmm. They just needed therapy, man, because they were looking for outlets for escapes. And, you know, suicide is never the answer. And, like, that's just heartbreaking to read. But instead of just, like, their parents looking inward and being like, could I have done differently? They're like, this must be Satan. <laughs> well, yeah. And like, also, what is this? It's the 80s. <laughs> it's crazy. Therapy man. wasn't a thing. I mean, yes, it was, but it wasn't I mean, common. It was, but it wasn't, it, it's not as well regarded as it is today. And even today, it's not as well regarded. Like, like there needs to be less stigma on therapy because really we're just trying to make it this crazy life. And because we don't understand like it. We really don't, we don't understand it. We don't have any else. understanding. Um, and that's kind of why, like, I'm, never mind. Anyways, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, so, anyways, here's where things kind of start to get a little unhinged. Uh, they haven't res- already. Yeah, I know. Uh, in response, Pulling's mother attempted to sue not only TSR Inc., which was the company that created the game, they also tried to sue the publisher of the game, and she also tried to sue the principal of her son's school. The reason for that was, according to Pulling, was that the principal had put, and I quote, put a curse on her son in a D&D Gee, session, yeah. and she actually <sighs> believed that this had merit. Thankfully, all the suits were dismissed. Thank Chalk God. one up for common sense, I guess. We're not going to get much of that in here, so enjoy that little Take, take your you little can. victories <laughs> in this one, for sure. Uh, that wasn't the end of polling, though. Uh, however, these setbacks did not you know, deter. Curses work. My voodoo doll that I have of you would have worked a long time ago. <laughs> maybe it's like the reverse. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Or maybe, oh, you know, it's all oh, the voodoo do. Your your power is so strong that the voodoo doll's hurting me. <laughs> Just it's like an Uno reverse. <laughs> reverse. Uh, however, these setbacks did not detour the grieving mother, as she went on to form bad. That is B A D D. Bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, yeah, this is basically a group for people who have a collective hatred of this game. They mm. worked to. They claim they weren't trying to ban the game. They were just simply trying to, you know, censor it a little bit, bring it a little down to earth. Um, you know, I wonder if people are still like, because, I mean, you still got parents banning books and shit. I wonder if there's a group of parents out there that are still trying to ban Dungeons and Dragons. Well, probably. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there are. I mean, you got to Especially think. Especially like a religious parent. This is a decade of this. Literally 10 plus oh, years yeah. of this. I don't care who you are. If you're like a parent, especially like, you know. Well, back then, you know, people were actually owning houses, you know, at age 18, 18. All right, well, um, you got to hurt my feelings on this podcast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so you had kids. Point is, you're bringing up your kids in your 20s. 
And I would argue during your twenties, you learn about, you learn a lot about who you're going to be like, um, your brain supposedly finally fully develops. Although I I'm, think your brain's still developing your twenties, honestly. <laughs> well, it I'm is like, it it's like 20, I think it's like 26. It, supposedly that's when it stops, but who knows? But anyways, if you were a parent during this time, a lot of it probably, you know, they still believe it. And actually, we're going to get into it a little later about um, some of the effects of today. Thankfully, yeah. um, it's mostly gone. But uh, so, yeah, after this group was formed, um, some of the accusations that they used to try to get rid of this game, uh, they accused the game of influencing people to commit the following acts. Uh, demonology, voodoo, prostitution, necromancy, suicide, cannibalism. Cannibalism. Uh, yes, cannibalism. Um, I bet you this, these, all these accusations came from someone that like lost several D and D campaigns, and he's just really <laughs> bad at the game. Yep, the like, this game suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as far as like kind of touching back on the, the you know the suicide part, um, a lot of people believe that if you died in this game, that meant you had to kill yourself. Jesus. So they, um, oh yeah. So this woman and her group became big enough, apparently, where they got a segment on 60 Minutes with Gary Gygax. Gary Gygax is actually the guy who created D and D, and he, funnily enough, was a Christian guy. I he just actually like Kyle's mom from South Park forming this group. <laughs> this I don't dude know if literally, South Park, but she's not an. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> this dude literally is a Christian made the game because he thought it'd be fun during this interview. He has like, can't even fathom like what these people are on about. And I was actually before, like right before we tuned in and started doing this, I was watching a little segment. And one piece of this was they were talking to a psychologist or a psychiatrist who believed, you know, they believe it was causing kids to commit, you know, to end their lives and, commit all kinds of antisocial behavior. And he was talking about a parent who was talking to him. This is all bull, by the way, but he said this. Uh, the parents he was talking to apparently claimed they witnessed their child summon a demon with D&D. &D, and I believe this is the same child, unfortunately, who later, sadly, ended his life. Yeah. And they claimed that he did it so he could leave his body and go do whatever satan worship or i honestly don't know but but yes parents were <sighs> already turning their teens death into a sensational story i just couldn't i couldn't imagine that well i think it's uh man you have you have some people that shouldn't definitely shouldn't be parents and oh, God, like no. i mean they're always i think everyone a lot of it's almost like human nature for a lot of people which unfortunately i don't think should be the case to seek attention and if it's not you, I'm gonna use my child and do it. That's with it. I mean, I'm getting on 60 minutes with Gary Gygax, <laughs> one way or another. It's like a kind of a concept. I mean, it's a little different, obviously, but it's like living vicariously through your children, you know. Oh, people definitely do that. You you see that all the time with like modern Sports. athletes. Sports. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 awful, man. Because honestly, at the end of the day, you should just let kids be kids. And I agree let them like i mean yes you should influence them uh in positive ways you know mm -hmm. like by showing them love and showing them compassion but you shouldn't you shouldn't have to do stuff like this like this is this was next level life is gonna crush their soul enough when they're an adult let them enjoy yeah. being a kid <laughs> like don't get me wrong i'll let my my nephew win nine out of ten chess matches but like that that tenth chess match i'm like no he's done in five moves <laughs> 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 You're not always going to win, son. <laughs> Trials during the panic, right? With all this fear-mongering going around, it eventually led to what is now considered the hallmark of the satanic, tri or the satanic panic, which was the trials. And honestly, this can be very... Like we mentioned at the start, this is, this is just like the Salem Witch Trials, right? Word, word against word. Mm -hmm. It was like McCarthyism, right? Which was during the... 50s and 60s you you see it in the movie Oppenheimer but basically if you were accused of communist you could you could very well have your life interrupted uh with lack of evidence in oh, an extreme case just... you, 
You put the death in extreme cases for treason. It was very objective in terms of guilt. There was not a lot of, as 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 it was written earlier, kangaroo courts, right? It's it's the jury's out for you in those in those cases. They already know what the outcome's going to be, and you're not going to like it. Yeah, and the whole thing's just for show. And in response to all this fear, police officers, psychologists, church staff, and even local politicians began to hold ritual crime seminars. And the purpose of these get-togethers was to educate the public on how to identify signs of SRA, satanic ritual abuse. This is also the time that mandatory reporting laws for child abuse came about. So the importance of the child, the mandatory reporting laws for child abuse is actually quite important here because what this essentially did beforehand, you know, and this is, I'm not saying this was right. I'm just saying beforehand, unfortunately, there was lots of cases of child abuse that were not reported. You know, it was kind of like, it's not my problem. That's their kids. I want nothing to do with it. End of story. Well, now all of a sudden, you know, a lot of like medical staff, um, police officers, well, obviously police officers, um, but any like professional, really, anybody has to report suspected child abuse. You have to. Otherwise, you, know, you could be that's, charged. There's a, yeah. there's a second little golden nugget that came from this whole thing. You know, right. Maybe, I mean, maybe you're looking thing. out for your kids a little closer. The only problem the with that time. was people started reporting, you know, that tied with the satanic ritual abuse tied with that people when people suspected oh they're satanists they reported it so reporting of child abuse skyrocketed um this doesn't necessarily mean there was more child abuse it just means people were reporting it more often um so it almost turbocharged all of this basically as a result of all this reports of sra skyrocketed and a number of high profile criminal trials were conducted throughout the 80s and even into the 90s like many other of the trials that came out of this era, one of the most famous cases involved a child care center. This one was located in Manhattan Beach, California. The center itself was run by the McMartin family. And the story all started out one afternoon when, after spending the day at the McNartin, McMartin's preschool, a child reported to their parents that they had been subjected to physical abuse. Obviously, any parent's going to look into this, and upon closer inspection, the parents themselves also believed that something was very wrong, had occurred, at the center and became troubled. And in response to these suspicions, the local authorities were called in to investigate. After performing a very brief preliminary investigation, the police contacted every parent of every child that had been left in the McMartin's care, which was over 200. In the message to the parents, the police informed them that it was quite possible that their children had been assaulted and that they should look for signs of abuse. As a result of this, the children were asked questions about what, if anything, they had experienced during their time at the center. Some of the allegations were as follows. SRA, traveling in a hot air balloon to get to said rituals, taken into underground tunnels below the facility where witch rules were supposedly conducted, flushed down the toilet into underground tunnels, just like in Harry Potter, <laughs> but were somehow miraculously cleaned before parents pick up. They claimed that Raymond Bucky, the grandson of the owner, was a witch and could fly. And one child even claimed that Chuck Norris was one of the abusers. See, when Chuck Norris gets involved in Manhattan <laughs> Beach, California, Maybe it's time that parent goes, oh, my child's just, okay. Yeah. My child saw him on TV and now now he's at school. Okay. okay. Wait, I want to, I want to, you know, obviously the first delegate, you know, the first one you mentioned. Yes, that is huge. If your kid's claiming that you need to look into it, call the police. Great. But I mean, Fernando, if your child came home from school one day and said to you, I saw Mr. Smith, the history teacher, flying like a witch. Oh, and by the way, Chuck Norris was beating up a child. Granted, it wasn't beating up a child, it was something else. But what are you going to say? I mean, Ray, what are you going to say to your child? Are you going to like be able to look at my you child doing? and probably be like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> right. That's like, cool. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, if it's a kid, like a little, little kid, which these are, these are, um, it's preschool. Right. So it's like not even kindergarten. That's what, five, six years old, maybe? Yeah. Which I've heard. First hand kids say these way little, crazier shit. These than little this. rats' brains aren't even fully developed. <laughs> right. They're still but learning it, words. <laughs> right. It's actually quite amazing that they were able to get some of this out. To be, it's amazing some of them knew who Chuck Norris was, to be honest with you. I mean, someone's dad probably watched <laughs> Walker, Texas Ranger a lot. No, that, that's true. All right. Yeah. He was also in karate movies, so I got to give him that. Yeah. As a result I, of these allegations, a number of employees at the center were charged with a collective 321 counts of child sexual abuse involving 48 different children. 
this is a bad time to be an educator <laughs> of any yeah. kind of children because you basically you are the new witch of that century of that decade you were the going to be the persecuted and i felt so bad Sorry. for you the accused include virginia mcmartin mm -hmm. the daughter of peggy okay. mcmartin oh her daughter yeah. peggy mcmartin her grandson aka the witch ray bucky his wife peggy bucky and an additional three teachers over the course of seven years, nothing. these trials carried on and were heavily televised via a number of media outlets. And because it took so long, the trial served as an ongoing backdrop to all the other things that were occurring throughout the 80s. During the actual trial, the defendants would be grilled on wild accusations. Children would be asked to use anatomically correct dolls to describe what happened. And the name of the entire McMartin family would be dragged through the mud forever. By the end of the proceedings, a whopping $15 million would be spent to make the trial happen. Today, it is still the most expensive and longest trial to be held in the United States. And worst of all, Raymond Bucky would spend five years in jail throughout the duration of these events, all without ever being convicted of any wrongdoing. It should be noted, however, that a lot of the jurors did actually believe something was happening, but many of them didn't believe it had been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It's because it hadn't. So when, uh, when they say, you know, they believe that stuff was happening, they actually do believe, a lot of them believe that there was some sexual assault going on unfortunately mm, I see. um but but furthermore like again i can't say whether he did or didn't um but the fact is they kept grilling them over you know satanic ritual abuse thinking that that was the case and uh don't be wrong the other charge is exceedingly you know um it needs to be dealt with you know obviously if that's true and the guy deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life in my opinion if you do that but uh you know, the fact that all it's this true. money was spent and they spent all this time and energy and blasted their names across, you know, the media for what this is, I think it was like, what, seven years you mentioned? I yeah. Think. yeah, seven years. And that's throughout the majority of the 80s. So as all the other stuff, like the D&D &D stuff, the rock music, everything else, this is in the background the entire time. Um, so, you know, you watch... You hear about a new song, you know, your church talks about whatever, whatever. Um, you come home, you turn on nightly news, and today they're like, oh, well, today in the trial, XYZ happened. You know, this kid is saying that Ray Bucky just flew away on a broom, and he's worshiping the devil. And then you go to bed, and then next week there's a new, you know, allegation or what? I mean, there was hundreds of allegations, so I'm sure it took a while just to get them all together. So you're hearing about new stuff every week. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you're hearing that constantly, I mean, look at anything now, anything in the news, you know, you get, you hear over and over and over, it pisses you off. If you so Paul Ingram was a very respectable man within Thurston County, located in Washington state. He held the positions of both chief civil deputy of the sheriff's department and was the Republican party chairman of the county. And despite this, he was accused by both of his children of assaulting them engaging in satanic rituals, and even slaughtering 25 babies. Interestingly enough, however, he claimed that he had no recollection of the events. We could have used Pazder here. <laughs> During this small obstacle, however, investigators worked hard to get him to remember these actions using several controversial methods, probably recovered memory therapy. This included using suggestion... Oh, <laughs> here we go. Sorry. No, you're fine. Does that happen really this... you? Yeah. Despite this small <laughs> obstacle... Investigators worked hard to get him to remember his actions using several controversial methods, including the recovered memory therapy that we mentioned earlier, throughout mentioned the, much of the interrogation. And eventually they did get him to remember these events, and his confession would grow more elaborate and unbelievable. Soon after admitting to the crimes, however, he did pull back on his confession. He would later claim that the law enforcement had coerced him into falsely believing that he had committed these heinous acts. But unfortunately for him, it would be too late, and now, and the now recanted statement would only count against him. Eventually, the trial would start and conclude, and Ingham would be convicted yeah. of six counts of sexual assault. He would then be sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he would go on to serve his entire sentence and was released in 2003. He has, however, never, never been found guilty of satanic ritual abuse. Yeah, so with this, it's a little... Again, I don't know if he did or not. Um, you know, this isn't that isn't necessarily what this is about. It's more about it's it's tough to say because when reading about it, 
it just seems maybe there was assault. I mean, but... it's convenient to be like, I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, it's face. I don't know. It's tough because, again, the focus on this was... Satan was never involved, I'll tell you that, though. Right, Satan was not involved. And a lot of people, you know, they they basically said that he he did this because he was a Satanist. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if he did or didn't do it, but he didn't. if he did do it, it wasn't because he was a Satanist. And the problem with that is... Satan's not real. You know, if you, again you start applying all this stuff to people like, okay, this is what a typical Satanist looks like. You know, they have these features, you know, let's say, let's just say in this case, he did do what he supposedly did. Okay. Well, this to me, you know, if I'm a real big proponent of, you know, Satan, Satanism is alive and well, um, you know, I'm looking at him and I'm like, okay, this is what a Satanist looks like. And then I look at my neighbor and, you know, say he listened to, metallica or whatever and i'm listening to my neighbor and they're listening to metallica I'm like okay well that guy did these horrible things to his child and he listened to metallica and that's the devil's music and i'm looking at my neighbor next door and he's listening to you know master of puppets and i'm like yeah he's probably doing the same thing because he has a rock kid. on eddie munson <laughs> oh we'll get to him later don't you worry <laughs> unfortunately these would not only be the, would not be the only cases of their kind during the panic Satanic ritual abuse cases like that of Martinsville in Saskatchewan and another in Bakerfield, California had similar results. A lot of pomp, a lot of pomp and circumstance with little evidence and the destruction of people's lives and reputations. As it turns out, these criminal proceedings would open a huge demand for satanic cult experts. People like that of Lawrence Pazder would be asked to offer their service and aid investigators in their testimony. He was also used in the McMartin trial. In some cases, the book Michelle Remembers would even be used as a training material for social workers to identify signs of SRA. The fact that that was used, and it was later later showed that it had zero evidence, is something that should be insane that it was even used in law. Yeah, this is not like a, you know, this is not a peer-reviewed academic book. You know, this is some guy wrote it. It was published. It was a sensational story. And that should have been it, to be honest. It should have been just that, you know, left as a story. And so, you know, if someone really cared enough and they wanted to really prove that this was real, then, okay, get the evidence to back it up. But, you know, well, we'll get to that later. But, uh, yeah, the fact that they're using a book like this to actually, you know, basically they're controlling someone's life. Like, what's going to happen with them with this book? You know, they could be in prison the rest of their life, and it's because they used a nonfiction book yep. to uh, train social workers to look for signs of SRA, which is absolute insanity. All right. Well, um, now the part you might have been waiting for, uh, we were talking about debunking and the aftermath. What happened so, after all this madness? So glad you asked. Uh, so whatever happened to the satanic panic of the 1980s anyways, why did it stop? Well, as time went on, and most of the big media circus-ridden trials came to an unclimactic end, for the most part, people eventually lost interest and focused their attention elsewhere. Well, that and the fact that most of the people and situations involved during the panic were completely debunked and labeled utter bullshit. For starters, let's take a look at the guy who started it all, Mike Warnke. He is the guy who wrote uh, The Satan Sour that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, as mentioned earlier, Warren Key made a lot of claims about how he was involved in a satanic cult and eventually found the strength to claw himself out of that world. Sounds like quite an inspirational story, right? Well, according to an investigation into Warren Key that was conducted by Cornerstone Magazine, that's all it was. A story. story. Warren Key was never in a cult, and he certainly never hung out with Charles Manson. No shit. Uh, After combing over records, it was discovered that there's absolutely no way this could have happened, as Manson was already in prison when Warnke was supposedly participating in said cult. And no one fact-checked it. Nope, that's the thing. No one fact-checked any of this stuff. Um, I mean, it's really not that hard to be... Grant, I get it. This was back then. There was no internet. Um, That is true. But we have the, you know, the private investigators we talked about earlier. So, you know, actually that explains a lot right there. <laughs> um, but then you do give them the internet and then too much stuff happens. Yeah, well, 
Anyways, yeah, generated images is wreaking havoc among yeah, uh, no, that's certain populations. Great for society. Terminator <laughs> didn't teach us anything. Alrighty. Uh, additionally, according to people who knew him and pictures taken of him in his youth, Warnke was a relatively healthy guy, despite the fact that he should have looked like an emaciated drug addict. Furthermore, a long line of tax fraud, multiple marriage scandals, and unsavory business practices were discovered. Now, granted, not all of these necessarily prove that he lied about the whole thing, but they don't paint him in a very good light. The guy trying to earn a quick buck. No. Why would he do that? I don't know. I mean, he made a lot of money. He's and, a best-selling uh, author. Best-selling author. He basically made his own congregation, too. I mean, he had a lot of followers, and people believed him and worked with him, and... You know, hence why he was able to make a lot of really bad business deals. Um, yeah, he, he, all on red, baby. He was a scam artist, a uh, charlatan, if you will, <laughs> a snake oil salesman. Mm, they usually are. So, what about Michelle Smith? Was her story legit? Well, the short answer to that is also no. According to an investigation conducted by McLean's Magazine's Paul Gresco. Smith's father denied all allegations of the supposed satanic ritual abuse conducted by his late wife, Virginia, who had passed away in 1964. Furthermore, it was discovered that Smith had siblings, and she completely failed to mention where they were in all of this. Yeah, so, you know, she had, I believe it was two siblings. Nothing was mentioned to these people. So what? Like, they just stood on the sidelines, and uh, Michelle was the the sacrificial lamb so to speak and she brought was she the middle child she must have been the middle child there you go so she's the middle, middle child, child. <laughs> so do you have middle a story child to syndrome. no just middle child syndrome baby looking for attention where we can get it. you weren't subjected to satanic ritual abuse nothing like that i think i'd remember that well we'll go get some uh recovered memory therapy yeah, 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 yeah. session we'll see how yeah, that me goes and you you could be my therapist <laughs> i'm sure it'll go you'll come out worse i promise you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be worse um, to further add seeds of doubt, no police report was ever filed on behalf of Smith, nor was any neighbor, family friend, or teacher able to corroborate any of the details that Michelle provided. Fascinating. So, yes, it's crazy how that works out. Uh, so yeah, that 81 day trial, you a ritual you had mentioned earlier. Uh, you think you'd remember something like you that? You think you would. You think you would. I mean, even if I was a young child, like 81 days is a long time. <laughs> so I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, so what about the 81 day ritual that she had mentioned earlier? <laughs> well, according to Smith, the ritual is attended by a large group of people at Ross Bay Cemetery. The problem with this statement is that if you look at the cemetery on a map, it's in the middle of a residential area. How on earth would no one notice all of these people in the middle of a cemetery, in the middle of the night, sacrificing children? Must people, have been a night shift. I, I must be. I mean, everyone must have soundproofed buildings and walls because... Uh, whispering, maybe. Whispering the witch. For 81 days. 81 days straight. No one sees... Uh... Also, the logistics behind that. Okay, so you got 81, 81 days. I don't have that much sick time. You got to feed these people. These people all probably have jobs. Yeah, I, I don't. Mean... I don't got that much PTO. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't either. You're lucky if you get like the average person's lucky if they get two weeks. I don't know. Yeah. Also, it's the '80s, so you know maybe a lot of places had like that unlimited. Hey, if if you work for certain company, like big companies, they'd give you unlimited paid time off. Where did that go? <laughs> like, I'm not feeling it today. I'm I'm not working. No, okay, well, have a great day. And you know what? Take the rest of the week off because uh, you need it. Um. So yeah. Uh, maybe the boss was in on it. <laughs> may, maybe. Maybe all these people. You know, maybe we need to do our own investigation. Maybe they're all part yeah. of the same company. Uh. Anyways. Soon after the investigation and a cease and desist order by the actual Church of Satan was issued to Pazder and Smith, the couple began to back away from the limelight and move further into obscurity. The couple, however, never explicitly stated that the story wasn't true. And by the way, when I say couple, I do mean couple. These two actually left their respective spouses and got married to one another. That's a little unethical, in my opinion, if you marry your psychiatric patient, um... I mean, that's got to be in the code of ethics somewhere for medical personnel, right? I mean, even if it isn't, it's just you're a bad person. <laughs> I mean, she comes to you with depression, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, uh, how about you leave your husband, and uh, I'll leave my wife, and we can get together and write a book and make 300 k Honestly, that sounds like a decent deal. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They should, maybe they're smart. You know, maybe maybe that's why we're poor. Because we have money. Hunches, yeah. Because <laughs> we, have, we have fucking morals, dude. So that, that must be it. Damn. 
Alrighty. Uh, as for all the trials we had discussed earlier, people were definitely arrested and some were put in jail for years for crimes they may or may not have committed. Despite this, however, not one single shred of evidence was ever produced of satanic ritual abuse. And as we mentioned, it was that, by the way, that number we pulled out at the beginning, it was like 12,000 cases. That's not a made up number. Like that is 12,000 unsubstantiated case of ritual abuse around the world. And nobody, not one single person was able to produce actual evidence of that. Yes. There was evidence of other wrongdoing that was brought about, but not devil worship. But Satan was never there. Or maybe you know what? this is just. We're only giving you kind of like the biggest ones covered in Western media, I would say, at least oh, in America. Yeah. Like actually, these cases were pretty prevalent, and it is very discouraging to read about this topic if you want to research further. I actually, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because, to be honest, I didn't know how long this was going to be, and I actually had some stuff from our countries. But here's a couple bullet points from other places. Um, Australia had a massive trial. In fact, they actually. Uh, there was some positive stuff that came from this, but I believe they had a huge conference, basically, of talking about children being abused in the country and kind of reworking everything to make it better. So I guess that's good. But again, the premise was satanic ritual abuse. Um, there was actually a case. There's multiple cases in Canada. Um, I know you said Western Canada's involved, but... You actually mentioned two earlier that were in Canada, um, in Saskatchewan and somewhere mm, else. Mm -hmm. um, but one crazy thing, probably the craziest thing I read, and this kind of ties into what's going on now. So Switzerland, I, I consider Switzerland a pretty rational country. You know, they seem, I mean, they, they seem to have war. a sturdy hair, head on their shoulders. They stay out of war, so I'll give them that one. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, they like did an investigation into their... I think it's a private company, but it's the largest congregation of like psychiatrists and stuff like that in hmm. that country. And multiple people believe that all this happened. People in the medical community over there. So you had doctors, psychiatrists, there were some police officers, there were some, you know, politicians, like one politician technically. They didn't list the name, you know, interestingly enough. But so people still believe this. Some people do believe this actually happened. And unfortunately, yeah. it's not just a bunch of idiots, you know, who don't hold any kind of power. It's some people who actually have power in society who believe this was a thing. That's the thing you'll get in society. There's always going to be two. There's always going to be more than one belief. Like one side, like there's always two sides to the story. And someone's always going to believe the second side. Mm -hmm. There's also really smart, dumb people. That is true. But I would count you in that. I'm a really dumb, smart person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a dumb shit person. <laughs> I'm just uh, the guy with a microphone. Yeah, pretty much. I'll give anybody a microphone these days. Yeah, I'm saying, dude, you just got to pay for it on Amazon. <laughs> uh, even when the infamous case of 1993, known today as the West Memphis Three, this was a horrible crime where three children were found brutally and murdered. This is the 90s now, by the this way. This is the 90s. This is like 92. This spread to the 90s. This was so in the north, in the north and the west, it kind of stopped. Like it never fully stopped, but it calmed down. However, in the Bible Belt, this was still alive and well in the 90s. There were people that still believe this stuff. It's probably still alive right now. Probably. Um, so these three children were found in a ditch. They were tied. They were dead. Um, you know, I believe it, one of them had been eviscerated or something like that. Uh, there, it was a pretty gruesome, it was gruesome murder. It was bad. Yeah. But these children, uh, the West Memphis Three, like the, the three that were convicted had like nothing to do with it. Oh, God, no. Um, so, yeah, anyways, when you take this into consideration, um, the fact of the matter is that the convictions that resulted from this case were likely fueled by the fear-mongering that was left over by the Satanic Panic. People feared the ringleader, Damien Eccles, which... As you mentioned with Eddie Munson. Eddie Munson's actually based off this guy. Really? Yep. Like, uh, fact check? Yes. Fact check. Nice. All right. Buzzfeed fact check. <laughs> so that means anything. Um, I actually wasn't going to put that in here, but I watched that. So that was interesting. Um, anyways, people feared Damien Eccles mostly because he fit the bill of the average Satan worshiper at the time. He had long black hair, listened to rock music, and he studied Wicca. He also shared a name with the antagonist in The Omen, which does not help you 
you know. I mean, when literally that movie is about the son of Satan. And yeah, you know, I mean, it kind of, it's, it's easy to during an era of immense Satan fear. It's easy to blame someone who has the name of the literal son of the devil. <sighs> That's not fair, though, but it it's not makes fair. it easy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, somehow the police decided that he had something to do with the crime and then proceeded to grill a man with an IQ of 72 to corroborate evidence that then ultimately led to the finger being pointed at Eccles and two others. When I say two others, the man with the IQ of 72, he was one of them. Uh, all three suspects would be convicted and Eccles would be handed a death sentence. Uh, thankfully, it turned out that it was all a mistake. Advances in DNA analysis ended up leading to all three being fully Thank See, I, actually, I actually wrote fully exonerated and wrongdoing. That's actually not correct. Um, what actually happened was um, it's like a weird deal where basically he he knew, basically the law was saying you did something wrong, but not what we convicted you on. So you're out, but you're still not looked favorably upon. It's a really weird thing. And to be honest, I don't know if it's legal. Um, that's, I don't know. So yeah, they weren't actually fully exonerated, but they were let out, and thankfully, Eccles' sentence was not carried out. He was taken out of prison before he was killed, so that's a good thing, I guess. The worst thing you can possibly do is, uh, you know, kill someone who you would... Basically, one of the biggest things in criminal justice, as it should be, is you would much rather a guilty person get away with a crime than an innocent person pay for a crime they did not commit. That's kind of supposed to be the way it is. Unfortunately, that's not always the way it is. So moving on to the aftermath, um, kind of bleeding into today. Today, the satanic panic of the 1980s was on as a history lesson of what not to do when confronted with the unknown and as a satirical theme in modern pop culture. Examples of this can be seen in Lil Nas X's Montero and Doja Cat's Scarlet, where both artists are clearly poking fun at the whole devil worship ordeal. I was reading the lyrics to Montero. It's been a while since I've heard the song. Yeah, it's been a few years since it's been out. It's pretty funny. I mean, lie. it always is. Dude. Like, like gonna... I've been watching this like <laughs> musical called Has Been Hotel, and it's like the catchy. I want to and... see that. It actually, looks pretty it's... good. I love music. I saw the fan, pilot, and for it's it. probably my like. Yeah, so I, I I I saw the pilot, but I finally years like... ago. All the songs are so catchy. The story's captivating and stuff. And yes, it focuses around like Satan and stuff. But I mean, it's just listen. If you still believe in like, I'll, I'll leave it with this. There's a lot of mythology in the world, not just from Christianity. And Christianity is definitely not like the first thing that has like all this mythos and mysterious and like evil and good, good versus evil. It's just believe what you want to believe, but don't don't attack other people. I, I agree. I mean. It's as long as no one's getting hurt. That's my big thing. As long do as no, no one's do hurt, no harm, man. do no harm. Yeah. If you're not doing harm, I don't really care. Just what you be, do. just be a good person. <laughs> don't be shitty. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Dude. Just like mind your own. Business. Do your best to stay in your lane and do your thing. Yeah. There you go. Mind your own business unless someone's actually getting hurt with exactly. actual evidence. Or, yes. Not just BS that you're spewing because it fits your narrative. That's been going on since so. Salem, brother. Yeah. And even before then. Speaking of, we're going there, by the way. Yeah, well, maybe. No, we're going there. You literally, yeah, you, we're going. We're not five hundred to prayers. No, we're not. We're at, well, this channel is not that. This is going to, it's the exactly. new channel. When this channel gets 500 uh, subscribers. Okay. okay, alrighty. Anyways, as you can probably imagine, both music videos of Montero and Scarlet caused a bit of a stir in some circles upon their respective releases. Um, additionally, as many of us saw in Stranger Things season four, the idea of the satanic panic serves as the literal backdrop for a good portion of the entire plot. This is portrayed through the way in which the town of Hawkins, Indiana re reacts to accusations that the town flunky Eddie Munson is supposedly recruiting patrons for the devil via his D and D group, the Hellfire Club. God, he was such a good character. He is. He is. He's, so, uh, whenever Stranger Things releases the fourth season or fifth season, whoever the likable character is is probably going to die. So don't. It's always don't like the likable character. They it's kill everybody like... that you don't want to die. Mm -hmm. I love like I like Bob. Asterisks. Yeah, I Bob really, is okay. I, I like, like the I like the Lexi. I like the Le Lexi was good too, but I like mm. Bob. Bob was a good guy, and he Sam got wise, baby. turned into a demodog sandwich. Mm. Like, a nice demodog little, chow. Nice little chow, dude. R.I.P. Bob. 
All right, Bob, this one's for you. As much as we'd like to say that the days of mass hysteria are over, simply because we have muttered as, matured as a society, we're okay. We're redoing that again. Yeah, muttered. muttered. Okay, sorry. <laughs> As much as we'd like to say the days of mass hysteria are simply over because we have matured as a society, we're inclined to believe that such an event could, and po probably will, happen again. All you have to do is look back at history, and my idea that history is cyclical. First it was the Salem witch trials, then it was the McCarthy hearings, then it was the satanic panic. And there are countless others that have happened in the USA and abroad. And honestly, this is probably going to happen again during our lifetime, and we just have to be well aware and open our eyes to it and just be willing to educate ourselves. You're during each of one of these rounds of moral panic, society believed that it was advanced enough and smart enough to separate facts from fiction. They believed with conviction and that they were witnessing was 100% accurate, and anybody who said otherwise was simply working for evil forces that were trying to destroy our way of life. I mean, why would you believe a handful of people who say that they are the good guys when millions of others are saying that they aren't? After all, isn't that what the devil would want them to say? True that. Yeah, so that's the... That's... That's the satanic panic of the 80s. And to be honest, it's, that's... It's honestly one of my favorite... <sighs> favorite subjects of, like, the, the unknown, right? But, like, the why this happened who let it happen and like i mean i know we just we just covered why but like the fact that this is something that like we were so scared as a society society of something we couldn't see or feel that we just took it for fact and we just ruined hundreds hundreds of lives like in a way it's kind of like you know again if you're one who was dragged into all this it's not fun no. but from a psychology standpoint, it's actually really interesting. It's oh, like yeah. pulling back the curtains on the human psyche about kind of the things we're truly afraid of. Obviously, not everyone's afraid of this. And we look back at this like these guys are a bunch of idiots. But to be fair, you know, go back to this time and talk about the Salem Witch Trial. They're probably going to feel the same exact way about that. They're like, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. Why would we ever believe it? How did we ever let that happen? Honestly, well, yeah. Here we go again. It just... You know what? I got, I got, mm -hmm. I got thoughts. I can't say these stats, but I got that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's episode one. Wait till we actually get enough people to like us where we can actually afford to get people to not like us before you start saying things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not only that, but we're probably going to have to delete all of our old videos because we're probably a little too unfiltered. Yeah, it's, that's okay. But you know what? Like, it's just, listen, like you said, we always think we're advanced as a society, but perhaps we could, we could just let evidence do its job. <laughs> The actually, actual evidence. Actually work and get the evidence. Yes. Well, maybe someday. But not today. today. is not that day. <laughs> no, if it's not today. But maybe someday. Oh. So any final thoughts? See where we can take this from a creative standpoint, because there are so many mysteries and events that uh, I would like to dig in deeper to. And this was a fun first one, because as a very religious kid growing up this one hit close to home i mean first of all i agree i can't wait this is i'm not gonna lie i've been excited about this all week mm. and the funny I thing know, is you wouldn't stop texting me i know i was on vacation and you're like hey <laughs> get and back. The funny the funny thing is like it goes this way with anything it doesn't matter if you're a youtuber a podcaster an actual artist a musician whatever they a lot of people say like your first 10 I hope 10. That'd be nice, but I don't, I think it's gonna be way more than that. But they say your first 10 episodes are gonna suck. Like, you're gonna look back and think, oh my god. And you know, the nice thing is with our YouTube videos, I look at the videos we make now, which are not perfect by any means, but and I look back at what we first started with, they're a lot better, I promise. So I have hope. And so you guys all know too, you know, this was a pretty heavy topic. And to be honest, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, but we just don't have time to talk about it. Um, but not everything we talk about is going to be this heavy. I promise it's not going to be, you know, morality issues and stuff. We're going to talk about fun, you know, other lighter things like ghosts and aliens. And, you know, we're going to toss in some conspiracy theories here and there. Doesn't necessarily mean I, I doesn't mean I believe in any of this stuff, but it's fun to talk about. And that's why ancient we're here. Ancient aliens. Ancient aliens. Yes. 
ancient aliens on history channel who really is. built the pyramids <laughs> <laughs> that is as real as it gets you know but no I, i'm super excited and actually oh, i'm excited for that one all right let me roll out some plugs to you and then we'll let you go so thank you for joining us today we really hope you enjoyed your time here with our first ever episode of the you go first podcast woo woo what, what? If you liked what you heard today, we'd love for you to give us a big thumbs up, five stars, whatever the hell it is that tells us we did a good job. You know, if it's on YouTube, drop a comment. That'd be cool. Uh, give us a pause review on whatever platform you're using. Or, by the way, if you absolutely hated this and have decided to listen to the whole entire episode because you're a masochist, feel free to let us know that as well. That's tell okay. me I suck. Yeah, tell him he sucks. Um, honestly, like I said... In the future, I'm probably went back at this, but wow, this was fucking terrible. This was cringy. Uh, so if you want to reach out to us with a question or idea, first of all, you'll make our day. Um, but, you know, if you give, we're always looking for ideas on stories to cover. Right, let and us know what you want us to research. And we'll we do will, it and we'll make we it an episode. Do it because uh, we're starting from scratch right now. So, But if you want to do that, you can we reach out to time. us. Reach out to us at yougofirst.tv at gmail.com. Pitch if our Venmo. Li- <laughs> no, we're not there yet. Uh, if you'd like to see our faces and the man, the myth, the legend, that is my double chin, you can check us out on YouTube at you Go First Pod. And if you like spooky video games, you can also check us out on our spooky gaming channel. That is at Ooh. you Go First Gaming. Um, there's a lot more videos over there. We've been doing that for not very long but we have about i don't know if you knew this or not we have about uh we put out our official 52nd video i believe um we have a better subscriber to video ratio which is always a sign of success success, in my opinion we're doing okay um they'll actually be i'm probably gonna pop in a quick game tomorrow and upload one because uh yeah i I gotta play something too i got time tomorrow i'll be honest i've been devoting a lot of time and energy into this and I'm happy about that, um, but I also don't want people thinking we're completely neglecting our channel because that I really enjoy doing that. I love playing mm-hmm. scary games. So yeah, that's the story. Those are the plugs, and I hope we see you next time. So with that, remember to stay spooky and have a great night, everybody. Peace out.